Great. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Michelle. I'm Brian Conklin. I'm the technical marketing engineer for the ASA CX Context Aware Firewall. I'll be showing you today the ASA CX and the Prime Security Manager, which is the management center for the ASA CX. I have very few slides, uh, four I think. Um, I'm going to go into some demos and I want to keep this interactive. Feel free to ask me any questions, interrupt me at any time. Oh, okay, well. <laughs> Not a problem with this group. This is yours. So, I brought in an ASA CX to show you here. Oh, wow. Uh, this is the 5585X chassis with an ASA blade in the bottom slot, a CX blade in the top. So that makes the ASA CX firewall. Here. So the CX is an entire blade? That's right, yes. So we can pull these out. Well, maybe we can. <laughs> So you can see, if I pull this out, this is actually our first ASA firewall to have built-in storage. Right, so that's a key difference here. Steve, storage! <laughs> 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 um, so the two blades together become the ASA CX firewall. And so what it can do, now feel free to take a look here. And this is, uh, I should say, this is a prototype blade. Um, so the final product may look a little different, but you can get the idea at least. So you're not cheaping yet? <laughs> not yet, not yet. Yeah, so, I, yeah, that's a good point actually. So this is a product that isn't shipping yet, uh, so you get kind of a preview into it. Um, it'll be shipping later this year in the July time. So the ASACX is a context-aware firewall, and I'll go into some detail on what I mean by that. Uh, but it has uh, authentication capability, so you can identify users either actively or passively through an AD agent. Uh, you can get application visibility and control, so you can see who's using what applications on the internet and what they're doing. Uh, you can do reputation filtering, and this is a key part of threat awareness, being able to block attacks uh, as they're coming into the network, um, being able to block uh, drive-by downloads of malware. URL filtering and all the uh, web categorization, uh, being able to do uh, uh, acceptable use controls based on these factors like URLs and, uh, and web categories. Secure mobility, so this is having to do with the AnyConnect client, having your users be out in the world and still be just as secure as if they were within your network so that they aren't out there pulling in viruses and then coming onto your network and spreading those viruses and worms. Um, this will be available in the SSP10 and SSP20 form factors initially. So if you're not familiar with the 5585, the way it works is there's the SSP10, 20, 40, and 60. And these are just different performance levels of the same product. Um, so initially this will be in the 10 and 20 range, which is still our high-end firewalls, but the, the lower end of that high-end firewall range. Uh, and then we'll be releasing it on the 40 and 60 as well. So is this part of the secu Cisco SecureX? That's right, strategy? yes, okay. exactly, yeah. So there are other products, part of the SecureX strategy, one of them is AnyConnect, which is our client, mobility client, uh, which includes a lot of different capabilities, including web filtering, uh, or you know, um, web security, as well as VPN capabilities, uh, both SSL VPN and IPsec. So is AnyConnect um, positioned as an endpoint security agent, in addition to being a, like a connectivity client? Um, sort of, yes. Uh, so the AnyConnect has the ability to protect the endpoint, but it does it more from a networking standpoint. So being able to uh, connect the device, either backhauling to uh, something like an ASA CX, that's that secure right. mobility element, uh, or possibly to the ScanSafe uh, web security, uh, cloud security environment. I do have a question that someone just asked, and I know this is why I would bring it up later if I didn't ask it now. Mm -hmm. The user authentication agent that you're using, is it AD only or is it LDAP? Oh, wait a second. This really mm -hmm. bothers me, and I'm going to bring this up. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys say LDAP, and I've worked with Cisco on this, you guys will have Sun One as a drop down. I I've seen this in um, on the ASA stuff. But you require a schema extension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really unnecessary and frustrating. Um, so in, in a way, I mean, if you have to tell me that I have to extend my schema and put all these custom attributes in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no. 
<coughs> well, you'll be pleased to know that it's not a requirement for the ASACX. Not <laughs> anymore. <laughs> 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 Back to the code. We want you to change <laughs> that. <laughs> We're calling the PM after this meeting. No. Um, so. Uh, as far as SecureX, we're talking about SecureX and how AnyConnect uh, fits into that, as well as the ICE product you may have heard of, which is the Identity Services Engine, is also a key part of that. And these will uh, integrate more and more in the future, you'll see. So um, Now the Prime Security Manager, and you'll see this in a moment, but um, the Prime Security Manager is the management center for the ASACX. Now there's an on-box built-in format, so if I log directly into the web interface of the ASACX right here on this device, I will get the Prime Security Manager. And it will look exactly the same as the off-box format, which can manage multiple devices. Right? So the only difference will be that you can apply policy to multiple devices. You'll have the concept of device grouping in order so to apply the policy. So what is that compared to Cisco Security Manager? Um, similar in concept, but um, there are some key differences. So. Cisco Security Manager will continue to manage our ASA firewalls, our IPS, routers, um, and it's still developing. You've seen it's, uh, it now has eventing and reporting and new features. Um, with this, we're going in kind of a different direction with the context awareness piece. And so this is kind of our new management center for that, for this ASA CX component, right? And this will also manage uh, the ASA and the CX parts. Okay, let me ask you this. So Cisco Prime LMS falls underneath that, right? So that's the off-box solution. So the, the security manager, Cisco Prime security manager that's off-box would be part of that suite or fall on sort that of. same server. Yeah, sort of. So LMS, I believe, is um, more Cisco works, whereas Prime, uh, there is a network management element to Prime. Right. So Prime is a uh, kind of an umbrella of management products. And so this Prime Security Manager is part of that umbrella. And you'll see more and more integration among the Prime products. This is Marshall products. Steroids, basically. Um, sort of, yeah. Well, you'll, you can make that decision when you see it. <laughs> and then one more thing. So then, so then the management piece for this that's on box, mm -hmm. no more ASDM or no ASDM. Correct. Oh, Correct. no more, you won't even be able to, there's no ASDM? At all? You can log into the ASA component with the ASDM uh, if you choose to. There's also the same CLI is still available. The idea being that we don't want customers to have to convert everything to this new format, right? I mean, people have ASAs in the field. They have layer three, layer four rules. We don't want them to have to move all to this new application identity threat aware system. Is this, is this uh, going to talk to, so is this going to talk to um, FWSMs? No, FWSM will, will still be separate, yeah. yeah. So this will be in this, the 5585 ASA format. Right? Okay. There is a new ASA services module, which sort of replaces the FWSM. Um, so, so as I was saying, um, we're not intending for people to move everything over to this new format all at once. We know that people still have a lot of firewall rules out there that are layer three, layer four based in the ASA, and that way they can add this functionality without having to overhaul everything all at once. They can migrate to it slowly. Right? So they can still use CLI, still use ASDM, still use CSM, um, but they can also use this Prime Security Manager for the new element, and it'll, it'll also uh, work with the, and, the, the ASA as well. I mean, one of the problems that we have um, is the Cisco, traditional Cisco management stuff doesn't really give us the ability to present um, here's, so for our change management process, we need to be able to present the current configuration like a diff. We need to be able to present a diff, for, uh, you know, and, but in an easy <coughs> format that, that is importable into Remedy for our mm -hmm. process. And I think a lot of people do this. And we have an extensive amount of changes, because I work for a financial services provider. We have hundreds mm -hmm. of firewalls and contexts. And yeah. Right now, you, we're not, we just don't have a handle on managing these devices. The GUI is, fun, is great from a sense of allowing the human mind to sort of get a visual picture of it, but it doesn't fit into our change management process. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, completely. And that's something that we took into account when building this. Um, so 
the way that people have traditionally uh, worked with this issue is that they will um, either store their command line version of the configuration offline, do some kind of diff, have archives of it um, that are date stamped. Um, with things like CSM, you have uh, configuration archives or other products that do management. Uh, you have some kind of configure archi configuration archive and rollback system. Um, with this, we try to really make it usable, more usable than that. So we are adding the ability to um, tag uh, policies and rules so that you can see, uh, you can just type in a change control window ID, for example, or a support ticket ID, mm -hmm. and see all of the changes that took place uh, when you went through that window. So you're saying I can actually use this interface. I mean, is there a database that's, that you guys have integrated? Yeah, underneath there's a database storing and this that information. Is, yeah. That, that's that, what is that? The type of database? Yeah. Uh, the type of database, I'm not certain. OK, but exact so you have format, a database and I can run searches yeah. on it. And then can I print out reports? Can I uh, have something that I can put into a ticket very more easily? Yeah, eventually. So this is a first version. We'll have okay. the ability to do um, access to that and, and store the information around ticketing and things like that. Um, being able to get to that information through maybe like an API or, or some other mechanism to bring it into your reporting tools or email, that, that's functionality that we're looking into for the future, absolutely. We can talk offline and I'll sure. tell you our unique... I, yeah, I'd love yeah. to talk more. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so this, like I said, will be the on-box and the off-box multi-device manager. Um, it, with the off-box version, you have uh, eventing, event storage, basically, off the box, right? So all of your ASACX in your network would send their events to centralized manager, either a VM or this virtual appliance. And it would store that information off-box. And, and it's extremely simple in that you can simply add hard drives to this or add virtual hard drives to your VM. And it'll just use that for eventing. It'll just continue to fill up as much space as you give it without having to reconfigure anything. I have a quick question. You just called that a virtual appliance, mm -hmm. that box sitting there? Yeah. Can you explain that? Um, yeah, so uh, there is a virtual machine format to the Prime Security Manager, which would, of course, run in VMware. Um, and then there's also, we would package it as an appliance, which just basically has the software built into it already ready to go. So, so it's physi so so physically in it. Yes, it is a, sorry, physical appliance, but it's a UCS server. I was um, just going to ask that. So yeah. when you start talking about UCS, and I'm going to diverge a little from security, will this tie into an existing UCS fabric as one of the blade devices and mm -hmm. be totally manageable? Yes, potentially it absolutely could. Potentially or yes? Yeah, yes, it, it absolutely so could. It's kind of like the Nexus 1010. So if you want to... Some mm -hmm. people, if they buy the Nexus yeah. 1000, they want a physical device, and I think yeah. this is the exactly right. So you yeah, can use, just run it a VM in your in your environment, or you can buy that thing mm -hmm. and right. just run it on there. I, I'm just seeing UCS oh, yeah. stackable yeah. server here, and I just kind of want to understand the whole vision for the whole whole platform. So yeah, I mean, for those customers who have an established virtual infrastructure, they would probably just download the VM and add it to their infrastructure. But for those who maybe don't, they want to purchase an appliance and not have to worry about setting up anything else to get this to run, they can go with this uh, format and it'll be ready to go. So that's pretty much all I have for slides. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. Yep. <laughs> uh, a quick question just came in. Um, somebody said, is Prime Security Manager also going to replace Mars? I think we... Yeah, actually, Mars is uh, end of life, actually, already. Yeah, that's, yes. I, that's the impression that yeah. it, I, I don't think he actually like said, this is the replacement for Mars. But, yeah. But it, it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Will yeah. this replace what Mars was doing it, That's the bigger I'm question. I'm not going to say yes to that. Um, you mean causing Mars had a, Mars was a very mature product. It had a lot of features. Um, this is not intended to replace Mars. Um, it, you'll see a lot of overlap in the feature set. Uh, but no, this is not a Mars replacement, Mars, per se. The features from Mars that Cisco wanted to keep were taken to Cisco Security Manager in version 4. So if you have a Mars, you need to look at Security Manager, but mostly you'll need to look at something else. Another question is, yeah. these, these are big boxes right now out of the gate. What about folks that have a lot of smaller ASAs? When are they mm -hmm. going to be able to get this technology? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. Um, so, one of the advantages of the way we have architected this solution is that it is not hardware dependent, it's very software centric. 
Um, and so it could potentially run on other platforms. Um, so I don't have a particular roadmap to share with you today, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, the, the ability is there to run it on other smaller platforms or, or a number of other platforms. But I would argue that this will only run on the new, like the X series ASAs. I, I seriously doubt that you could run this on a current gen 5510, <coughs> 5520, yeah. 5540, yeah. 80. Because it's fair to say that this is your entrance, Cisco's entrance into the next gen territory, firewall territory. Yeah. Is yeah. that? You, I mean, that's you didn't, definitely fair to yeah, say. Yeah, you didn't say it, but it's like because it's such a loaded <coughs> phrase. But mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, I mean, as you were saying, it, it's it, the it's too many requirements. It's too beefy. To right, run on right, yeah. This is doing deep packet inspection on every single packet going through the device. And so, I mean, your 5510 is probably not going to be able to handle that very well. But. So maybe I'll ask the next loaded question, what's the roadmap look like for the existing ASA platform side by side to this? We do have the ASA 5500X series, uh, which we just launched at RSA and is orderable now. But I don't have those in my data racks now. Right. Get a full right. lift. Yeah, that's... <laughs> What's the roadmap? Yeah, what so I that, have in my racks. that is the new platform for uh, for the ASA mid range series. Um, so eventually, this. What about the low range? Uh, like, I mean, the 5505? Um, no particular uh, replacement right now for the 5505. Yeah, but. Um, so Cisco will announce a product, then the high end product will come to the market for a sh for limited customer shipment yeah. so that they can work out any. Mm -hmm. problems or any, you know, discover what happens in the field and work out what might be missing or any bugs that might have missed in testing. And then once that, then they'll bring down to the smaller models, this is what they consistently do for all of their products, smaller models will creep down and then the numbers will increase, but by then the quality issues and usability issues would have been resolved. So you will always see Cisco introduce products like this at the high end, small numbers, limited deployment, probably with large companies who've got lots of skills. Sure and uh, cautious about what they want to do. And so in the long term, you could say, yeah, there'll be smaller ones. But Strategically, is Cisco going to send everybody in this direction? In other words, towards uh, Prime and deep packet inspection for all the boxes and take away the, I guess you call it an old school staple firewall. Yeah, um, not necessarily. Because um, like I said, there are still a lot of ASAs out in the market um, that you know have a lot of rules. And uh, we found that mostly people in the data center environment, when they're firewalling their data center or their internal uh, networks, they want more speeds and feeds, right? Low latency. Um, there's, a, there's a big market for low latency in yeah. firewalling. Um, well, and you just can't do that with deep packet inspection. And I, I think, so from, <coughs> from our standpoint, as, as a service provider, the next gen firewall does not interest our management at all. Those capabilities, they're like, we don't have users, that's not what we're interested mm -hmm. in, except, you know, we have a small user community. But, uh, so can, you're, are you saying you can actually turn that functionality off mm -hmm. and make it act more like the cool. regular? Yeah, ASA? because underneath this is the ASA firewall, you know, the, the ASA that's currently available today. Um, and it's a very high-speed firewall. It you know exists in the data center today, so and we know is, there is a software connection from the ASA code we run today. Mm -hmm. What this is? Uh, yes, exactly. So, so actually, this bottom blade is running the ASA software that you're familiar with, and then the CX software is in the top blade, and the two work symbiotically. It, okay. So, then tell me, can you take me through hardware-wise? A packet comes in. How mm -hmm. is it processed in that hardware? Sure. So it doesn't matter what interface you're coming in on, um, you will always be processed by the ASA bottom blade first. Okay. Right, and that's doing your layer three, layer four firewalling, some layer seven inspection, um, you know, that you're familiar with for SMTP and um, fix up. SIP, fix yeah. ups, yeah. exactly. So you're doing your NAT there, maybe VPN. Um, and then what it'll do is move up to the top blade for the added CX processing. And you can decide what traffic you want to have that added processing. So if you have a specific web app, uh, specific application in your data center that um, requires low latency, you could bypass all that functionality with that particular um, server. Uh, the CX will do all this added functionality that I've been talking about where it can identify users, 
uh, can identify the application. There's all the deep packet inspection, reputation checking, things like that. Uh, uh, just, I just have a question. You said that uh, regardless of where the packet comes in, it will mm -hmm. always be processed by the bottom one first. That's right. So what happens if the packet arrives on one of the ports on the top? On the top? One? It yeah. will be passed down to the bottom slot first. So mm -hmm. what, what kind of uh, what kind of backplane bandwidth are we talking about? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head what the yeah. backplane yeah. bandwidth is, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, we do care. Yeah, we ca I care. We do yeah. care. <laughs> to a point. I mean, to uh, yeah. you gotta, you gotta put so that information is on the website. Yeah, it, it is available. Yeah. Product manuals on Cisco's website. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So I unfortunately, don't have it off the top of my head, but it's a hard link connection. Um, so it's just a physical connection between the two blades. No, I mean, it, the answer I don't know on top of my head is, it, yeah. is, is fine. But it, it is important. So. Great. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, let's go. All right. So actually, um, actually, I do, I do, because always when you, uh, I mean, I, I was burned by one of the uh, uh, one of the products uh -huh. that was handling particular kind of traffic in a wrong way. Not necessarily a security product, but every time that you have to pass the traffic from one blade to another to do some processing and return it back, mm -hmm. uh, and you are dealing with uh, multicast traffic, uh, it's important where the uh, replication is done. Is it mm -hmm. done at the ingress or is it the egress replication? And in this case, it would matter, especially if you're trying to kind of put this in any kind of a multicast environment. And yeah, yeah that's a that's financial that's institution yeah, yeah, comes that, to mind. Yeah, yeah. In, in that sense, that so is a good point. Definitely true. Um, you could think of these interfaces as actually just directly connecting to the bottom blade across the back plane, right? So they're not processed in any way by the top blade okay. until okay. they're processed and normalized and, and layer three, layer four. So the multicast packet comes in and it goes through the box. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, directly to that box. So it's blade. not going to be replicated in ingress and sent to multiple destinations if it needs to go. And right, no. And we're, we're, uh, what's your stance on uh, mixed mode still? I know I heard a rumor that you guys were going to support mixed mode on ASA in July or something. Yeah. Um, and is that, what, when do you think like safe harbor code or, you know, I mean, because that'll be a dot .o release. Yeah. I mean, is that something you're going to continue to, or because that's such an FWSM thing. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. I mean, are you committed to that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the ASA SM, which is the sort of the replacement for the FWSM, right. it does support mixed mode today, in, and that's version ASA 8.5. Okay. Um, so the next version coming, like you say, uh, that will have the mixed mode support in it across the platforms. So not it, just the ASA SM. Yeah, I think we're not because there are issues with it. But yeah. yeah, but that's sort of separate from the ASA CX conversation right, right. per se. Yeah. I had a question on the procedural part of the way that the CX uh, does things. Right now, you guys can identify web traffic, and you can do you can crack it open and find the user agent to identify the OS that you're coming from. Mm -hmm. But anything that's not web traffic, you have to rely on the AnyConnect client to pre-tag it for you before it comes up there. Is that a speed issue with your 1.0 code? You want to make sure that's going to work and work fast? And is it something you plan on baking into the OS down the road after the dot zero release so that right. I'm not forced to install any connect clients on every one of my devices in the network and run VPNs back to mm -hmm. my LAN just for the purposes of saying <coughs> you can't get on Facebook anymore? Right, yeah, and that's a very good point. So, <laughs> what, so what he's describing here is that uh, the device identification is what you're referring to? Right. So device identification right now works on uh, a couple of different methods to try and determine what type of device it's, it's, the traffic is coming from, either a Windows machine, or Mac OS, iPad, iPhone. Right. Um, and so it will look at two different things. First it'll look, is the AnyConnect client installed? If it is, what kind of device is this? And AnyConnect will tell it. If AnyConnect is not available, it'll try to determine from the user agent what kind of device that was. Um, and of course, user agents could be faked and it's only for web traffic. Um, so, yes, we do need better ways uh, to uh, determine the device type, and we do have some plans for that. Um, in the version the 1 release, we'll just have those two methods. It's not just for device type identification, though. It's also for non-standard mm -hmm. port identification, because mm -hmm. right now all you guys can match on is HTTP, HTTPS, without any connect. Actually, with this, we have full firewalling capabilities across all ports and protocols. In the CX module. Mm -hmm. And that, that was in your documentation that I read last week, is that, because there was the whole list of facts, and one of them yeah. was, let's say I want to match on someone trying to use SSH tunneling to evade the firewall. Yeah. And how can I crack that packet open and prevent that from happening? And the answer was, 
You can use any connect to do that today. Okay. So I, I want to see that that functionality yeah. gets punted into the actual CX module yeah. for various reasons. And there's okay. a way to well, do that. And actually, you know, there's a way to do that. You, mm -hmm. in, in deep packet inspection, they can identify Tor because of the, the, the way there are certain qualities to the Tor packet that's yeah. different mm -hmm. than a regular SSL, Definitely. like HTTPS packet. Definitely. And actually, so this can handle traffic across all ports and protocols. So if you have a particular application, I you know a lot of IM clients like to uh, switch ports. They like to tunnel into HTTP. They like to encrypt themselves to try to get out. And this will still catch that. So even if your traffic is running on port 16,000 with uh, TLS encryption, it'll still pull apart that packet, decrypt it, and see what's underneath and identify the application with correctly. With the AnyConnect client? No, without the AnyConnect client. It'll do that anyway. Yeah, so and that'll be for all traffic. Can you man in the middle it? You can man in the middle it with a TLS proxy, exactly. Yep. Is there a roadmap to slot the hardware into a Nexus chassis at some point? Um, nothing I can really say definitively right now, um, but like I said, it, it is a software platform, so it, it could run across uh, something like a Nexus or, yeah, something like that, yeah, potentially. Yes. I was trying to potentially, was that, was that a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, or was that uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to say for sure because you know it hasn't been committed yet on the roadmap, but yeah, I mean it's definitely something we're looking into. Yeah. Not likely you might be. What is the committed to sixty five hundred demo services? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're limited on time, so let's. Sure. So um, I brought up the Prime Security Manager, and this is this is the uh, multi-device manager. So this is managing two ASA CX in my lab, um, but if I brought up one of those ASA CX, it'd be the same interface. Uh, so here we can see the different policies that we have created. And um, I'll go into applications, because a big part of this context-aware firewalling is application identification. Let's take a look at some of the capabilities. So if I type in Facebook here, um, you'll notice we get a lot of different Facebook applications, right? So it's very easy to search and see what kind of applications might be um, identifiable. There's a lot of different application types. So some vendors like to lump these all into just Facebook apps. Uh, but you know, we can determine, is this an app used for games? Is this an app used for business or education? You know, schools might want to allow educational apps. Um, enterprises might want to allow their own marketing team or uh, bringing in new talent, but maybe block games or video. And if we scroll down to some of the uh, other Facebook sub-applications, so you notice things like messages. You could write a policy that says you could read Facebook messages and post them, but maybe you can't uh, upload or download attachments with those messages. And so a lot of very granular control and depth of control for each of these apps. Um, some of the usability uh, features we've added into this also is that you can see right away if you have any of that traffic in your network. So we're in the configuration component of the device right now, but we don't have to switch over to the monitoring component to see what's going on. We can see it right here. And I can click that to see, drill down and, and see further what that exact traffic is. We could also see if that particular application is used in a policy anywhere. And I could just do view usage details. You can see I have a policy here that blocks our interns from getting to Facebook games and to deny. So you can see right away if that uh, application is being used. Ours and, and uh, security manager tried to do that, but it was still yeah, funky. yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Another good example is iTunes. Um, so for iTunes, we could detect this iTunes from a desktop, an iPhone, an iPad, and each of these has different behaviors associated with it. So you could say um, that uh, maybe we're a university, we want to allow our students to get to iBooks, right? But we don't want them streaming and downloading video and killing our bandwidth. So we can block high video and, and music. Uh, we could also view these by type. And so you can see kind of the, the wide breadth of applications that might be identified here. So we could go down to peer-to-peer -peer file sharing applications. And we can see that BitTorrent could be identified, or uh, file sharing services on the web like Box.net or Dropbox. Uh, question about yeah. BitTorrent. What about the encrypted torrent? Encrypted BitTorrent is actually also here. It's down at the bottom. Oh, OK. Yep. Step. Yeah. Very nice. 
So uh, a, a, another question I have is, so all these definitions, um, uh, do are they independent of the firmware? So yes. can I re can I update the the definitions because you know Facebook makes you know a couple changes a quarter in terms of how you do uploads and so forth and um, so are we going to be able to update this without having to do like yeah a absolutely thing? okay yeah so these are separate from the firmware so there's the application underneath right the system um, but then there's also constantly updating reputation scores, reputation databases, and application databases and, and web categories as well. And all of this comes from Cisco SIO, which is Security Intelligence and Operations. They do constant um, uh, investigation of the internet. And a lot of our devices, like our web security appliances and email security appliances, IPSs, they're sending telemetry data back into Cisco SIO in order to create these application and, signatures. And do you, do you write your stuff in-house, or are you working with an outside yes. organization? All of this is in-house. We don't use any so, third okay. parties so I have, for... I, I have two There's questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, all of this that I'm seeing sounds very familiar and reminds me of another Cisco product that I had the opportunity to use in the past called the, um, uh, the Service Control Engine, mm -hmm. uh, which uses similar uh, signatures. This is why I asked about the encrypted torrent, because that would tell me that there was some, some seriousness in this. Uh, is it is it related? Uh, are these uh, uh, is this security intelligence and operations? Is this sh are these shared application signatures that, for example, for people who may have it, this is mostly a service provider tech, but mm -hmm. who have a service control engine deployed uh, with with their subscription, would they be able to get the same kind of signatures, or is there going to be a disparity? In the yeah, these application signatures are shared among our devices. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure specifically about that device. What, okay. what was the device again? Service control. Engine. Service control so engine. I'm not sure about that one. Stuff, right? Yes, uh, but the this one comes from PQ actually. Okay. Yeah. the web application firewall. But, but I yeah. mean the signature base that we're talking about. Yes, the about signature is, base yeah, signature is platform. that's that was the inception of it. Yeah, exactly, and. Um, this is shared among the WSA web security appliance and the ScanSafe cloud security as well. So what does this product mean for the Ironport platform? Because now there's an incredible overlap in the platform. There is a lot of overlap. Um, <laughs> the web security appliance, of course, will stay strong. Uh, a lot of people prefer... Until everybody put CXs in. Right. Not necessarily. A lot of people prefer to have a dedicated proxy in their network rather than rely on a firewall. Right. So everyone's different. Um, but but this you do have internal storage on this device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to just store the rule base. You can't store it in flash. It's not yeah. Walk. Yeah. So the well, big difference yeah. between the hard drive. drive. So the Actually, the rule base is stored in flash internally. Uh, the hard drives are used entirely for eventing. And they're in a RAID 1 array for redundancy. But if both hard drives were to go down, uh, you would still be running. You know, yeah. It wouldn't bring down your network or anything. So the big difference between the iPod is the iPod's a proxy. Yeah, yes. absolutely. No, I'm saying, yeah. but, but in terms of storage, theoretically, it could be a proxy. In terms of feature compliance and what the outcomes are, yes, but the iron port's a completely different technology. It does it properly. Absolutely. This is just using DPI, which is a hack on top. So if you want real security, you go and get a proxy. If you want to do something that's good enough for what you can do, then you use this. I, I think the entire next-gen firewall model totally throws that idea out. I mean, the entire ability to get down at deep inspection layers and apply the rules there as deep opposed to redirecting traffic. Deep inspection there, policy are switching. Content and scanning there are advantages to oh, both okay. models. Tom. Yeah. <clears throat> Tom. 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 Quick question on the mm -hmm. thing you got on screen from Twitter. Sure. Is that binary allow deny only or can I throttle on those? Um, this is currently allow deny only. Now, the web security appliance does allow throttling. For throttle? And we'll likely add that in a, we're looking at that for a future release, yeah. Okay, that's Thank why you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Oh, uh, so I, I got a question to add. Um, from a network engineering perspective, like I, um, I do a lot of high level design and architecture work for my network, mm -hmm. and I tend to look at the nodes in my network as network nodes. Yeah. And traditionally, networking on, on appliances has, has been terrible. And I'm wondering if, what sort of, uh, you talked earlier about context. Um, are you going to support BGP on this? Um, and I ask because one, one of the things that we kind of find appealing about one of your competitors mm -hmm. is that they support virtual route tables, they support routing protocols, and even enabling MPLS on their firewalls. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the CX is going to support BGP because it doesn't handle any of the actual base networking of the device. It's basically a service module that you punt packets to to do higher level functions. Yeah, that is. 
That is currently the way it is now, yeah. Um, but you do have the ASA underneath all of that. So if the ASA uh, support, you know, ASA does support currently EIGRP, OSPF, RIP, of course, uh, but uh, not BGP currently. Yeah. So if it were to add BGP eventually, then this whole system would then support it as well. Another thing that you mentioned was the, the way these signatures are built are through that security, mm -hmm. what do you call it? The Cisco open? SIO. SIO, mm -hmm. and you said that all of your devices are sending telemetry back to Cisco. My paranoia level there just <laughs> jumped <laughs> through the roof. You know, yes. Can you, can you explain that? A sure, little bit? it is an opt-in. Uh, yes, IPS, WSA, ESA, that's the web mm -hmm. security appliance and email security appliance. It's an opt-in program where they can send us uh, data, uh, anonymized data about uh, attacks that are going on in their network. So. Um, the way it might work is if one IPS in the field receives an attack from a certain IP address, um, say another country, China or Russia or somewhere, uh, well, then... Let's not name any names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or anywhere. Um, then, you know, that information is put into our database and sent to other IPSs in the field so that they can that get the advantage of that. doesn't happen by default, right? Sorry? Yeah, uh, in order to receive that information, do you ha also have to opt in to no, send? No, actually no. receiving, you can receive it without sending. Yeah, okay. so you can gain the benefit of that system without having to uh, opt into sending your own data. Um, could I, I just wanted to sort of advocate for, um, I, I, the problem that I'm seeing with a lot of these security yes. devices out in the marketplace is that you guys, seem to focus more on an enterprise use case as opposed to a service provider use case. And you're not, like, we can have hundreds of these devices. And there's just, you're not giving us a really user, a, a way to, uh, like, we have to go out there and buy something like UltraPoint to do massive, you know, configuration management, configuration change management. Um, mm -hmm. I, you're just not meeting our needs. Okay. No, it's good <laughs> feedback. Um, um, I, I mean, is that is that fair for anybody else who comes from the service provider side? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. market built. You know, the one thing uh, I just got a comment on Twitter saying, "Well, why would you want routing on the firewall? It's a firewall." Oh, we, and it, you know what? It's, why wouldn't you? We, it's yeah. a network node. And you know, we use that. It, it, it is a yeah. network node. There, there, that's kind of a, a big debate is why would you want routing on your firewall? It's a different because use it routes yeah. packets. Yeah, but there's another school of thought that says it should just do firewalling and let your, leave routing to your routers and but you know, it, yeah, but you know when trying to get however, into you the... However, just uh, piled on a ton of functionality right here. Yeah. People will pile 10 million things in the firewall and say, well, I don't do routing because I keep it simple. It is a network node. It mm -hmm. should support routing. Yeah. By that and, extension, and my fire, router should firewall things. They could. There's and nothing stopping them. They, 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 they do, but if you want any any sort of serious functionality, you have to go to device that like this. A, a, a use case, and I know this device is not meant for this particular use case, but a case for BGP on ASA firewall is a relatively small company, like the company I work for, where we do have a traffic that needs protection from a firewall, and we have two BGP feeds. I mean, why would we need to get the router when we could have everything on the firewall that we yeah, so and there's definitely yeah. multiple schools I don't need of thought to, on I, this. I, I don't need to support a full BGP feed. I don't need support for BGP routes, reflectors, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. I just need to be able to, to multi-home yeah. without the need to buy another device. Yeah. So, what, so, <laughs> okay. so one of the philosophies we've tried to take with this device from the very beginning is to not take a side on those schools of thought because you know one isn't necessarily more correct than the other. And we try to give people flexibility to be able to implement this uh, in the way that they choose. And you'll see that uh, as this product matures over time uh, more and more. Um, so I just want to kind of wrap up a few things in the demo here. Um, let's try creating a policy and you can kind of see how that works. Brian, we really got it stop. Oh, are we yeah. hard stop? Okay. Okay. Same All right thing. then. The only thing I'd like to point out is no Java. That's a web browser. That's right. Oh, yeah. This is all built <laughs> in. <laughs> it's all built in. Oh, 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 oh. It's all built on HTML5, so all of this will work awesome. on my iPad. Can, can, you, can, can you backport that to the ASA now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean I need Netscape 4.7? <laughs> For the next version, can you put it all in Flash? Thanks very yes. much. Yes, and I will be hanging around. I'm Good sure point. you have a lot more questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Really